and welcome to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm David Wilcox, a senior fellow here at the Institute. It's a great honor to host Jared Bernstein, a member of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, to explain the administration's view as to why today's economic circumstances call for a robust strategy for boosting public and private investment. We're grateful to the White House and Jared for coming here to the Peterson Institute to detail the administration's thinking on this crucial issue. Most of you will already be familiar with Jared's stellar credentials. To highlight just a few of those credentials, Jared was chief economist to then Vice President Biden from 2009 to 2011. From 2011 to 2020, he was a senior fellow at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and he was a widely read columnist for the Washington Post. Jared has served as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors from day one of the current administration. As a member of the CEA, Jared weighs in on an extremely broad range of economic issues confronting the administration, but he brings to these responsibilities a longstanding focus on the well being of the less privileged members of society. But my favorite bit of Jared history is that he didn't study economics or any other social sciences as an undergrad. His undergraduate degree is in music from the Manhattan School of Music where he studied double bass. So if you know something about jazz, that might be an alternative conversation starter with Jared. It's an honor and a pleasure to host Jared for the first of several Peterson events that we're having in the next few weeks about the US economy including a speech on October 6th by Federal Reserve Governor Lisa Cook. Also on October 6th, my Peterson Institute colleagues will release our semi-annual outlook for the US and global economies. And both of those events will be webcast live. And with that, I invite Jared Bernstein to the podium. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, uh, David. And I want to also thank Michelle Heller, who has uh, uh, been instrumental in helping me uh, get this into, into the schedule, and to Adam Posen, of course, David, uh, and uh, to PIA in general. Uh, uh, many of the folks on the roster here have been uh, willing to take calls from myself and colleagues and uh, help guide us on issues that uh, PIA is so long associated with issues that are, of course, top of mind uh, today as we speak. Uh, but I'm, I'm here to uh, deliver a speech I call, Whatever's Around the Next Corner, an Investment Agenda Will Be Needed. Good thing we've got one. Uh, for decades, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the U.S. and other advanced economies were considered more demand constrained than supply constrained. Uh, focusing on the U.S. in particular, Periods of full employment were the exception, not the rule. Uh, from the early 1980s to right before the pandemic, the unemployment rate uh, was above CBO's estimate of the natural rate two-thirds of the time, compared to one-third in the 1949 to 1980 period. Inflation consistently missed the Federal Reserve's 2% target from the downside. Estimates of the real neutral rate of interest, R star, trended down. Economists talked of, quote, secular stagnation, savings gluts, and embedded shortfalls in demand whose costs fell disproportionately on the most economically vulnerable groups. Since the pandemic, or more precisely, since the end of the short pandemic-induced recession, the macro situation in the United States has looked quite different. Inflation has climbed to 40-year highs, and the Fed is engaged in a hiking cycle, the likes of which we haven't seen since then, to reduce price pressures and maintain anchored expectations. Unemployment fell at a record pace and uh, is now at 3.7% near a 50-year low. Quits remain elevated and the vacancy to unemployment ratio, a high beta signal of labor demand, remains at a record high of about two. By some measures, all this labor demand is outpacing labor supply, which still hasn't recovered to its pre-pandemic level, even after adjusting for the aging demographics of the workforce. While improvement has clearly occurred, supply shortfalls and snarl-ups of supply chains have been 
a hallmark of this period. As a member of the White House economics team, I found myself digging into the nuances of, quote, dwell time, which is the length of time a shipping container spends in a port, microprocessor supply chains, energy supplies, tracking their costs and their inventories from crude to refined products to, de to daily retail prices. This apparent flip from demand-constrained to supply-constrained economies is the subject of my talk today. It raises such questions as, is this a lasting change or a temporary one? What happened to the factors that we believe led to the demand constraints that quite recently prevailed? Will the supply shocks born of the pandemic fully dissipate as the pandemic becomes endemic? What are the different implications for policy of each of these outcomes? I admit from the start that there are as yet few definitive answers to these questions from the many conversations I've had with economists both in and out of our administration, including many who uh, reside here at PIIE and many who are listening today, it seems axiomatic that we're in a moment of considerable uncertainty where forecasts have even wider error bands than usual. However, in a perhaps somewhat surprising result of my investigation into these questions, one prominent policy solution comes out of the inquiry, regardless of whether the macro economy turns out to be demand constrained, supply constrained, or some combination of both. We will likely need more public and private investment. If this conclusion is correct, the good news is that the Biden economic agenda is centered around a set of policies, many of which have uh, already been legislated, that are designed to significantly lift direct public investment and just as significantly crowd in private investment. Now, given that the case for demand-constrained advanced economies was robustly made in recent years, I will be brief in reviewing that case. In my years at the Economic Policy Institute, we argued that the U.S. labor force, labor market was rarely at full employment and that the cost of this slack fell disproportionately on the least advantaged. Macroeconomists documented the secular decline in our star, while forecasts of the path of interest rates were found to be repeatedly biased up. Ben Bernanke introduced the concept of savings glut dynamics in this context, making linkages between the international financial flows and destructive credit bubbles. Throughout this pre-pandemic period, despite often strong fiscal and monetary support, inflation tended to miss the Fed's target from the downside, leading Larry Summers to reintroduce the concept of secular stagnation, where desired savings consistently outpaces desired investment. These developments are familiar to this audience, and in the interest of time, I won't belabor the point. The more interesting question is, is it plausible that a persistent secular trend like this could quickly and lastingly be reversed? Probing the question requires thinking about the factors behind constrained demand and asking whether they're still in play or at least still lurking in the wings. So let's do so. Aging demographics and its attendant slower labor force growth is typically on this list. And it not only remains in play, but there are pressing questions as to whether the pandemic made this challenge even steeper even through the long, uh, uh, either through the impact of long COVID, diminished immigration, or shifting preferences. There may be countervailing factors that offset some of these labor supply headwinds, like wider spread employer acceptance of work from home, but it's too early to assess their persistence or magnitude. Next, the trade imbalances that characterize Bernanke's savings glut hypothesis, persistent current account surpluses in countries with whom we increasingly trade, driving persistent deficits in other countries, seems to remain in play as well. Though here again, the pandemic, as well as the impact of Putin's war in Ukraine and its impact on Europe, clouds the analysis. China, in particular, has long played a role in the savings glut, and while its current account as a share of its GDP is well off its high when Bernanke introduced this idea, it has solidly remained in surplus. I refer folks to PIEE, PIIE's own Joe Gagnon on these points through the lens of currency management. Joe also points out that other high savers in Asia continue to run large trade surpluses. Income inequality remains elevated, uh, though Bidenomics maintains that when it comes to labor earnings, the low unemployment rate that prevails today lifts worker bargaining power. A recent CEA blog uh, features a dramatic graph showing wage growth by race, ethnicity, with black workers' wage gains solidly outpacing whites. 
Still, labor share of income while climbing out of its trough remains below its historical average, and the profit share remains elevated as do more comprehensive measures of wealth inequality. Next, and though this is a critical issue that deserves more attention than I, uh, attention than I give it here, a brief look at recent literature on the productivity question suggests its growth is unlikely to shift much one way or the other post-pandemic. In a recent Jackson Hole presentation, productivity expert John Fernald said, quote, we came into the pandemic on a slow growth path. We look likely to leave on a similar path. Uh, Gordon and Sayed's new paper reaches a similar conclusion, uh, though recent readings depend, more recent readings depend on how BEA ultimately resolved the historic a uh, historically large gap between GDP and GDI. Uh, finally, in demand-constrained frameworks, government debt is generally considered to lead to an increase in demand and uh, the neutral interest rate. Uh, in her Jackson Hole handout, uh, uh, Gita Gopanath argued that pandemic-induced fiscal debt accumulation was one of the few forces she expected to lead to an increase in the natural interest rate relative to its pre-pandemic uh, trend. To be clear, in noting this relationship, I am not advocating for higher government debt. And you've probably heard members of our administration tout the historically large amount of deficit reduction occurring under our watch, including well over one trillion in fiscal year uh, 22, the one we're just about to end. Uh, we're also very proud that the Inflation Reduction Act is one of the few pieces of legislation since the Affordable Care Act that includes any pay-fors at all, much less ones that more than uh, fully offset uh, the bill's cost. Now, it is possible that measures uh, will, uh, it is possible that these measures will eventually change the longer-term budget outlook. One analysis found that the Inflation Reduction Act actually raises almost two trillion in new revenues uh, over 20 years, as opposed to the 10-year window I was just citing. But for now, CBO's post-pandemic outlook is uh, similar to their pre-pandemic forecast, suggesting little structural change in this factor. So let me now turn to post-pandemic supply constraints. Supply constraints have also been straightforward to identify. Uh, from our administration's perspective, some of the key constraints related to, the first, uh, to first the pandemic and later to Putin's invasion include, of course, microprocessors. Uh, while the chip shortage was and is still felt in many industries, the most obvious fallout from disruptions to this supply chain was the decline in vehicle production, a problem that rippled through both used and new car markets. The impact of this shortage on inflation was dramatic. In February 2021 alone, U.S. auto and light truck assemblies fell by 15 percent and assemblies remain millions off their pre-pandemic pace. Over the three years prior to the pandemic, changes in vehicle inflation which today has an average weight of about 9% in the CPI, contributed essentially nothing to the yearly rate of inflation. Last year, in 2021, due in large part to the chip shortages, motor vehicles added 1.6 percentage points to inflation, accounting for about 23% of the seven-point increase in the headline CPI. Ports and ship-to-shelf throughput. We're all aware of the maritime parking lot photos from the ports of LA and Long Beach. Uh, Jason Furman correctly notes that this is partially a function of elevated demand for goods over services, so it's not solely a supply-side phenomenon, though it also stems from the sharp 2021 supply constraints in services. At any rate, our supply-side task force intervened aggressively at the ports, and we've seen notable improvements with throughput back to pre-pandemic levels and, for many firms, inventory buildups underway or complete. However, while many frictions and costs have come down, disruptions remain. The New York Fed's Global Supply Chain Pressure Index recently peaked at over four standard deviations above its long-term average value. And while it has declined since, and quite sharply, at the end of August, it was still at 1.5, still high by historical standards. Energy? Energy demand uh, already outpaced supply before uh, Putin's invasion, but since then, the supplies of natural gas in particular have been low relative to, dem to demand, leading to sharp price increases, especially in Europe. Here in the US, as of late September, the retail gas price was about 25%, or $1.25, below its peak, that's price per gallon, retail gas, but still 6.5% above its pre-invasion uh, price level. 
tight refinery capacity here and abroad remains one important dimension of this supply constraint. Labor market. Though the growth in labor force participation out of its low trough has been historically fast in this expansion, there exists an excess of labor demand over labor supply. As Goldman Sachs researchers calculate the gap, payroll employment plus vacancies exceeds available labor supply by over 5 million workers, or 3% of the labor force. And as I noted earlier, the vacancy to unemployment ratio stands at a historical peak of two. This is leading to greater worker bargaining clout as seen in higher quit rates supporting job upgrading and the commensurate upward pressure on wages. In Bidenomics, these forces are features, not bugs, as they help to deliver more equitable results of the type I heightened above regarding racial, uh, I highlighted above regarding uh, racial wage trends. But of course, we are aware of their inflationary implications and that the Fed considers the job market overheated. So evaluating all of this evidence that I just shared with you on the demand constraint and supply constraint side, how should we evaluate these and many other relevant variables in regards to their post-pandemic trajectories? The task is made harder by the interaction of the pandemic, fiscal and monetary policy interventions, ongoing supply side constraints, Consider, for example, the pandemic-induced shift in spending patterns to goods over services. That gap is still quite far from fully reverting, uh, but most of us expect that it is, if not quite cyclical, then non-structural. Rising interest rates reflect the Fed's hiking campaign, not an obvious structural reversal in our star. And there is a cogent argument that before that campaign began, historically large positive impulses from fiscal and monetary policies were strong enough to temporarily overpower the forces driving structural shortfall demand, structural demand shortfalls. Still, my CEA colleagues and I do not believe that forces that drove demand constraints are gone and thus believe that prudent policy requires us to consider the risk that desired savings continues to outpace desired investment once we return to whatever new normal awaits us. It is not incidental to our conclusion that the strong positive impulses just mentioned have shifted into reverse. Also supporting our view is the fact that back in the mid-90s, the FOMC took the Fed's fund rate, the Fed funds rate, all the way from about 10 to about 3% to deliver uh, necessary monetary stimulus. Today, most estimates have a terminal federal funds rate uh, with a four handle, just a point above the nadir, of the earlier reduction cycle. On the supply side, we've seen some real improvement. Accepting autos, not a trivial exception. Retail inventories are 13% above pre-pandemic levels. 91% of goods at grocery and drug stores are in stock and available on shelves about the level of their pre-pandemic average. Shipping container costs are coming back down to earth, and the ports of LA and Long Beach are far less congested. But neither are we out of the supply side woods. We must be mindful of constraints in the areas of labor supply, energy, chips, along with many other bottlenecks that may arise as firms reconfigure supply chains that prove to be insufficiently resilient during the pandemic shock. And the persistence of COVID-19, the increased prevalence of extreme weather events, and geopolitical threats from uh, China to Russia's ongoing unprovoked invasion continue to be sources of supply side uncertainty. So what's a policymaker to do, given all these cross currents? In the near term, the Biden economics team will continue to follow the president's instructions to do all we can to ease price pressures and help families gain some breathing room. As you know, this involves supporting an independent Fed, doing whatever we can to lower the costs that put the most pressure on family budgets, and reducing the budget deficit to generate negative fiscal impulse. But in the light of the analysis I've shared with you today, what's the optimal policy agenda in a world where demand constraints may reawaken and supply shortfalls in key areas may persist? Is there an agenda? Is there an agenda that meets both sides of this equation? We think there is, and we think it centers on investment, both public and private. In demand-constrained economies, savings exceeds investment. Absent better opportunities and guardrails, such savings can and have turned to unprotective and systematically risky pursuits, including inflated real estate and financial bubbles, with underregulated digital assets now added to this risky mix. We have, however, much better investment opportunities right under our noses. 
We know, for example, that federal and subfederal governments have long disinvested in critical public goods. We also view the lack of supply chain resiliency revealed by the pandemic to provide a stern warning about future shocks. And while private investment in clean energy has increasing momentum, we believe that greater public policy certainty and well-designed incentives are required to crowd in necessary levels of such investment. This investment framework is a good way to view the triumvirate of the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act, and the Chips and Science Act. Consider the importance of, consider the importance of these investments, both from the perspective of improving the economy supply side and on the demand side, creating good jobs along the way. <clears throat> along with traditional roads and bridges upgrading, the infrastructure bill invests in repairing deeply troubling and highly inadequate shortfalls in water systems that had been front page news. It removes lead from pipes for up to 10 million American households and 400,000 schools and child care centers that currently lack safe drinking water. It invests $65 billion in closing the digital divide, helping to ensure that every American, wherever they reside, has access to reliable high-speed internet. It invests deeply in public transit and upgrades our nation's airports and ports. It invests in a national network of electric vehicle chargers and one of my personal favorite measures, the Department of Transportation is implementing a competitive grant program that gives jurisdiction higher scores in the grant process if they feature housing and land use policies to promote density, rural Main Street revitalization, and transit-oriented development. To my ears, those sorts of programs provide a fulsome answer to the question, what's a policymaker to do when facing the question of whether the future will be demand-constrained or supply-constrained? The Chips and Science Act invests over $50 billion for research development and workforce development, the production of semiconductors addressing both the U.S. economy, supply, and demand sides. It includes a 25% investment tax credit for capital expenses for manufacturing of semiconductors and related equipment, a move that is already crowding in billions in private investment in states across the country, including Arizona, Idaho, Ohio, and North Carolina. The lesser known science part of the act invests in reinvigorating US R&D, not just in semiconductors, but also in advanced computing, communications, energy, and quantum information technologies. It authorizes 10 billion to invest in regional innovation and technology hubs across the country, bringing together state and local governments, higher education, unions, businesses, and community-based organizations to create regional partnerships to develop technology, innovation, and manufacturing sectors. Along with the cost reduction in healthcare and prescri prescription drug spending, the Inflation Reduction Act is designed to boost investment in clean energy, achieve the president's climate goals, and again, to crowd in sideline capitals waiting to see which way the government will lean in this space. The act includes the largest investment in clean manufacturing on record, incenting solar and wind power production with credits for production in low-income communities, heat pump production and deployment, and domestic EV production, including vehicles, batteries, and chargers. Of course, our work is not done. And one area we view as absolutely critical to the economy supply side is addressing the market failure in child and elder care. While existing labor supply constraints have many dimensions, including potential preference shifts, we're confident that standing up an affordable, accessible child care sector would significantly improve labor supply among caretakers. We cannot know the macro economy that awaits us around the next corner, nor what sorts of constraints it will present to economic policymakers. And of course, countless hurdles exist that I haven't discussed today, from implementation challenges to political ones. But I assure you that this White House is deeply excited about this agenda, and we will continue to push as hard as we can to realize President Biden's vision, one that we believe will leave the US economy far better positioned to achieve strong and equitable growth for decades to come. Thank you. Thank you, Jared, for that uh, statement. I, I wanna underscore the importance of much of what you just said, because it goes right to the heart of one of the key structural challenges that I think 
macro policymakers are going to be confronting for the next decade or more, and that is this issue of a low R star. And I think you put forward a quite compelling case that a robust policy of investment uh, inducement, both private and public, is a sensible strategy in the face of that challenge. Thank um, you. I do want to get to the substance of your speech during our conversation uh, now, but I'd like to start uh, with the UK, where to borrow a phrase from the soccer world, it seems like the uh, incoming prime minister and her team seem to have scored a massive version of an own goal, uh, to put it mildly. I'm wondering what you can share about what the White House team, uh, how they see the implications of these developments in the UK, and do you have any concerns about potential spillover effects to the US economy? Well, first of all, they would call it uh, football over there. <laughs> uh, um, I thought that would confuse an yeah, American yeah, yeah. audience. Let's keep it simple. I realize we have an international audience. Yes. Uh, I should uh, have said both. First of all, uh, again, thank you for uh, hosting and, and for the uh, um, Endorse, endorsement of the, the theme. Uh, we're watching this very closely. The president's being kept uh, 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 up on all the developments. Uh, uh, Secretary Yellen and the Treasury uh, markets team tracking everything as you would expect. Um, I would say uh, a couple of things in terms of the current event macro, uh, which is embedded in your question. Um, uh, first of all, regarding spillovers to the U.S., which is always a question for us, um, especially uh, in a moment we're in right now with um, cross currents, Fed uh, rate hiking cycle, elevated prices, uh, very tight labor market, you know, tailwinds, headwinds. Um, the, uh, the spillovers from uh, what's going on in the U.K. or more broadly uh, in, in Europe as well, um, would obviously occur through channels uh, in involving trade, but also financial. And I think if you look at the uh, trade linkages between the UK and the US, um, in terms of goods uh, trade, uh, we don't export and ex or import particularly large shares uh, to the UK. Services are a bigger deal, uh, but we think the real connections there are more through the financial channels. Uh, New York and London are obviously uh, central nodes for uh, financial markets. Uh, and there, uh, we're, we're watching things uh, very, very closely. Um, our estimates, though, is that uh, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, economy remains in uh, a, a strong place to uh, deal with uh, a full set of headwinds, including uh, those uh, coming from abroad. In part, we're a far more closed economy than many of the ones uh, that, than the U.K. or the E.U., uh, but in, it, it, it's also the case that um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the very tight labor market, good job creation, pretty strong consumer spending, um, balance sheets in, uh, at least in the aggregate, balance sheets that are uh, quite uh, solid. So I think one useful way to think about it is in terms of financial contagion, which again is where I would look for spillover, um, you know, we're, we're clearly, in, in our view, not looking at a 2007-2008 situation where um, there was uh, really very, uh, you know, really very consequential financial contagion uh, from the uh, implosion of a housing bubble in a situation where uh, undercapitalization and low, bu low capital buffers uh, were so implicated, you know, the balance sheet aspect of that of that recession. Uh, we think that, uh, in fact, there's um, much more buffering, much more insulation, and that probably what's most important from this uh, episode is to look at the policy implications, particularly regarding fiscal policies and what that means in a, a, a period of global tightening. So um, to follow up on that, uh, I'm wondering whether uh, the wildly adverse reaction in the UK to what appears to be an ill-timed and perhaps ill-considered uh, fiscal policy expansion, uh, does that give you any concerns about potential constraints on the ability of US fiscal policymakers to move uh, 
if circumstances develop in such a way to warrant uh, a fiscal response here? Yeah, I, I would say generally no, uh, but I think you know you're, what, what, it matters a lot what you do. Um, fiscal policy is a broad topic, and uh, uh, there are different ways to thread that needle. Um, I, my first response to your question is, and I had this in my talk, I think it's very important, and we think it's very important, the president has stressed this uh, um, uh, many times over. Uh, yes, along with Fed independence, uh, you know, he has a, a three-tiered approach for helping ease inflationary pressures. Fed independence, that's number one. Uh, number two is to help families where we can with budget constraints. But number three is deficit reduction. Um, the idea of uh, uh, negative fiscal impulse as a complement to negative monetary impulse is a very important one right now and one that uh, is, uh, uh, our economic team feels strongly about. And that's why you know, we tout uh, historically large deficit reduction uh, this year and uh, the, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, paying for itself and and, and uh, you know, th those uh, um, dynamics that I cited in the talk. Now, I think also implicit in your question is, um, is, the, is, the following, is the following reframing of your question. Suppose you need to do fiscal policy in, in, a, in, in a climate where doing it wrong could be fighting the Fed. What is doing it right? How do you do fiscal policy uh, that doesn't fight the Fed? And you know, obviously, the UK is struggling with that. Um, and, and it seems to me that an obvious answer is to be very narrowly targeted about uh, any fiscal measures you undertake. Uh, but that's you know, certainly not you know, on our table right now. It's just how I, would, how I would frame how to think about that. Related to the global economic uh, situation, it is striking that in the past few weeks, there, the overall global economic climate seems to have become more complicated, darker on, on the whole, uh, with a very serious situation apparently developing in, in Italy, uh, with the apparent sabotage of natural gas pipelines that are supplying uh, gas, critical energy supply to Europe. Uh, and that's just to name a couple of uh, situations. Can you envision a circumstance or set of circumstances in which near-term fiscal policy actions here might be warranted? Well, in a way, that's kind of asking for, uh, you know, a recession probability. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go there. Um, one can see what markets are uh, talking about when it comes to those kinds of calculations. I think the uh, perspective from the White House, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst, that's really the smart way to play this. We have some real tailwinds that get um, obscured in the hurly-burly of especially the media debate. Um, obviously and completely understandably, uh, the focus is on elevated inflation, and the president has called that, uh, addressing that his number one domestic priority, and uh, we're all rowing in the same direction on that. You know, but the fact that we have an unemployment rate that's near a 50-year low, that we have uh, uh, such a welcoming job market in terms of vacancies. And I did, in my speech, try to respect the double-edged sword that that uh, reflects from the perspective of, of, uh, of what the Fed is looking at. But that kind of a tailwind is, is really important. We've seen some uh, easing in prices, of course, of, of gasoline. And uh, some of our actions there have helped the release of oil from the strategic reserves. But you know, things I took you through in the speech, the work in the ports, uh, some of the uh, work uh, with chips. I didn't mention. Um, I didn't mention some work we're trying to do in the, in the food sector, um, and of course the Inflation Reduction Act, which actually works quite quickly in some areas to start reducing healthcare costs. So we think that along with our um, uh, uh, anti-inflation agenda on the supply side, uh, with the Fed uh, doing what they're doing and our, our support of their uh, uh, actions uh, from. You know, from an in, from our independent perch, um, that uh, we don't. You know, we we don't uh, we we don't we, we don't see a. Um, you know, we we're we're not we're not really trying to figure out what's the probability of a soft landing versus a hard landing. What we're trying to do is to um, ensure that families. 
are have adequate and strong employment opportunities and are uh, 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 and doing all we can to ease their price pressures. Now, should we encounter a, a period where vulnerable Americans are exposed in a way that they're currently not, then yes, there are definitely countercyclical fiscal policies that would get on the table. But I would argue that the um, proper approach, given what I said in my last response to you, answering the question, how do you thread that needle without fighting the Fed, is kind of the critical question. And that leads you to narrowly targeted fiscal measures. Staying with the uh, international theme for the moment, there are a lot of signs, disquieting signs, in my view, pointing to what one might call a great decoupling in the global economy. The apparent sabotage of those uh, natural gas pipelines mm -hmm. perhaps being all too literal a case study, but that's, that's hardly the end of it. Uh, it's easy to envision that if this decoupling proceeds, it could be possible that countries in effect will be forced to choose sides uh, so that uh, supply, chain, supply chains may be limited only to friendly countries. Research is uh, shared much less freely. Do you worry that a decoupled global economy might be one that where inflation figures much more prominently in the macroeconomic landscape, uh, as opposed to the persistent disinflationary forces that were uh, seemed very strong during the world of global integration? You know, to some extent, that gets to the heart of what I was trying to uh, think about in the talk that I gave today. Um, I find it pretty hard to see around the corner and answer the, uh, you know, answer the question is, is the economy going to be uh, more demand constrained or supply constrained? Um, and uh, how decoupling, uh, uh, you know, how our relationship with the rest of the globe, economic relationship with the rest of the globe factors into that is a really important and interesting question that you teed up, I thought, very well just then. Um, so I would say that it really comes down to the following. First of all, I think it's easy to exaggerate this view of, of decoupling or autarky or you know, the extent to which um, uh, uh, we want to, um, uh, the extent to which we want to um, onshore uh, production versus remain engaged in global trade. Uh, we want to do both. Um, and I think it's the, the first part that's uh, the, the kind of d domestic reduction, onshoring things that were offshored uh, that are um, you know, probably most, uh, some of the most important insights I've gained in my time uh, in the White House from this perspective of international economics. Let me start with a very microeconomic example. Um, at some point in the pandemic, a uh, one chip uh, semiconductor fabrication plant in Malaysia shut down for a couple of weeks. I think it was COVID related. And six auto producers in uh, the US uh, and Mexico, I, I believe I have this right, um, shut down for also two weeks, or essentially shut down. They took lines off out of production. One, one semiconductor fabricator, one se semiconductor fab. Um, uh, that is, uh, at one level, an indictment of a, of a narrow international portfolio, uh, but it's also um, an, a, a, a recognition that um, domestic supply chains and global supply chains failed uh, a resiliency test. Um, when you put this in the area of national security, uh, I can tell you that uh, colleagues of mine at the White House take that uh, as a very serious challenge. So the core of the policies that um, I tried to talk about here, some of which do very much uh, stress an industrial policy that makes investments uh, here in America, um, uh, we view as uh, a, uh, an economically necessary and smart reaction to the kinds of non-resiliencies uh, and security concerns and health concerns that were exposed over this point. But I think the thing, especially for a PIIE audience, is that um, we need to, as we do this, we also need to be very, uh, uh, pay a lot of attention uh, to uh, other realities in this space that push us 
to um, maintain our engagement in, in global trade flows. I'll give you a good example. We're starting even to hear some of this today. Um, we have uh, very much domestic production incentivized, as I described in my talk, uh, particularly in uh, CHIPS and in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act around clean energy. Well, um, think back to uh, the Trump tariffs. So the Trump tariffs at one point, uh, there was a tariff on aluminum. The Trump tariff, uh, they, they wanted to uh, protect domestic aluminum industries. Well, the aluminum lobby went to the White House or went to the USTR and said, we need a waiver. <laughs> they need a waiver because, I mean, this thing was supposed to protect them. They were asking for a waiver uh, because of intermediate goods that they imported to help them make aluminum. So we are well aware that um, there are parts of the international trade omelet that you can't unscramble that you shouldn't want to unscramble. And so um, our provisions have to do two things at once. They have to address the security and non-resiliency of chains that were revealed during the pandemic, uh, but they also have to maintain uh, the, uh, the international connections that have been you know, important to uh, the economy's supply side and uh, you know, maintain adequate competition uh, while uh, making sure that uh, um, uh, uh, industries are not overly concentrated. And I think it's a, it's a delicate balance, uh, but it's one that, in my view, uh, we're, trying to, uh, we're trying to make in a way that I think makes sense for both uh, domestic and uh, for, for, for both our domestic growth and for our international partners. Um, related to this, there are some uh, countries that have pursued a strategy of economic development that has featured import substitution. Mm. And there is some evidence, as I understand it, that these countries, these economies, end up being less resilient rather than more over time. So I'm curious uh, how you see the emerging strategy that more boldly proclaims uh, mm -hmm. policy of um, industrial policy embodied in the triumvirate of bills <laughs> that you just enumerated in your speech uh, and how that factors into your thinking. Yeah, what was the first part of your question again? Because uh, that, that, that... So there's a, a set of countries who pursued a strategy of import substitution. Mm -hmm. yep. And the academic literature in this area suggests that when they do that, they suffer from a loss of resilience rather than a gain in resilience. One could view a strategy of onshoring as a version of import substitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trade literature uh, concludes that that's a mistake if you're trying to build uh, resilience. Well, I think that to the extent that we just, I mean, again, this is, this is what, what I think the pandemic revealed, that um, uh, we lacked uh, you know, significant resilience in key areas of our supply chains. And um, in our first economic report of the president from the CEA, uh, our team uh, did a, a chapter on this, which I, I commend to everyone who has that question. It's a, a good question, one I expect to get here at PIIE. Um, because, again, I think the idea here is to try to thread a needle. I think that anyone who comes out of what we've just been through and um, doesn't, uh, and doesn't uh, recognize uh, the need for some degree of import substitution to improve resiliency in areas like chips, uh, in areas like clean energy, uh, chips, by the way, which has national security implications, um, you know, from our view is probably uh, at least seeing things pretty differently. Uh, but I'd also say the following. Now we're going to talk political economy, uh, which I think is, you know, really important and somewhat missing from the analysis uh, that you, uh, that, that you, uh, uh, you know, correctly cited from the literature. Um, in, order to accomplish, uh, in order to achieve the investment agenda that I just described, uh, where we do the necessary amount of public investment that's been uh, gone wanting for so many decades. You know, it became a joke, Infrastructure Week, uh, but this president managed to legislate it. Um, in order to get those over the legislative goal line, in order to crowd in um, the, the private investment in areas uh, uh, like chips and, and EVs and clean energy, um, 
There needs to be uh, ways in which the tax, the U.S. taxpayer is supporting domestic production because um, you just are, are, aren't going to get these across the, uh, uh, the legislative goal line if, uh, if that's not the case. So I think we have to be mindful that we live in a world where political realities um, have, um, you know, uh, can, can block uh, necessary legislation. Um, we don't want to do that in a, in a way that leads to uh, disengagement or decoupling uh, with uh, uh, international markets or international trade. We want to do that in a way that um, uh, uh, both uh, uh, keeps the kinds of uh, innovative practices that uh, have uh, helped us develop these industries, uh, keeps them uh, uh, here uh, at home, and um, doesn't cut off our, our, nose, our international nose to spite our face. One of the things that um, fits in here, by the way, I didn't say a lot about it, is the uh, science part of the Chips and Science Act, where we have authorized significant resources to invest in domestic R&D. Um, and uh, that uh, is a critical innovative uh, piece of the puzzle that we think complements this agenda as well. Uh, last question. In your uh, speech, you highlighted some recent economic research that has been fairly discouraging, as I read it, uh, about the prospect for productivity growth, mm -hmm. which is absolutely essential, core to the determination of the standard of living. Without productivity growth, you can't support a rising uh, standard of living. You made the case for substantial investments, mm -hmm. public and private, as one way of bolstering private uh, 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 productivity growth. Are there other steps uh, that the administration might have in mind to promote a more rapid pace of growth of productivity? I think the, um, the pieces I described, the, the, the triumvirate, um, you know, very much all fit into that. You know, they're, they're, they're the answers I would mostly give. Um, I think what, uh, I would uh, add there is uh, some of the workforce development components. Um, obviously, uh, we not only need um, to boost our labor supply, but we also need to boost uh, the, uh, you know, the quality of the labor supply. That's an input into total factor productivity, in fact. And um, that those resources are parts of, of these measures, particularly uh, the CHIPS Act. Um, has uh, real workforce development as part of it. And one of the things I really like about it is it's not just you know, on the coasts. It's also internal uh, uh, to, uh, to the country in rural areas. Um, and uh, I would argue that uh, workforce development is a complement to uh, uh, productivity growth when you're making these investments in, uh, in, um, in, in, the, in this sort of capital. Um, I think the uh, the other another piece of this is is broadband access uh, as part of the the Infrastructure Act. Um, I think it's been another uh, uh, cl clarity a, a, around the pandemic that uh, if you're an air, if you're in an area, a rural area, for example, uh, where you have uh, lousy broadband access, ultimately that's going to uh, be a real productivity killer. Uh, finally, there's interesting. Um, this isn't so much our work, but just an interesting development around working from home. And, you know, different studies say different things, but there's some, uh, apparently there's some evidence that working from home uh, helps uh, with the productivity uh, uh, side. Um, I don't know that our, our policies are uh, implicated too much there, but I know economists are watching that. Um, I, I've often tried to think about what is it about working from home that makes you more productive? A lot of times it ends up just being sort of snacking from home or napping from home. Uh, but uh, but uh, you don't commute, and and that's uh, lately. I don't know if you've had this experience, but lately the Washington commute is kind of getting back to its pre-pandemic level. So uh, that that may be a source of of, of greater productivity growth as well. Uh, but I I think that the uh, that broadly speaking, you know, I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to well, first. Let me say two things. I think, and th and then we this is perhaps a good place to end. Um, a lot of times when economists start talking about future productivity growth, you know, it's time to take out your phone and start paging through because we really don't, you know, it's really very hard to make 
uh, to see around that corner. Um, I think that said, with that caveat, I think you'd have to look pretty far and wide to find as positive and as hopeful a productivity enhancing agenda as the one I took you through uh, today. And I think if, and, and I want to give uh, the president some credit here. Um, if you consider not just that agenda, but get, getting that agenda through this political environment, then I think you have to you know, sort of give him an asterisk uh, because not only did uh, he achieve uh, this, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, very important and uh, potentially uh, productivity enhancing investment agenda, but he in, in achieved somehow, you know, he and the team and the, uh, uh, the folks in many cases bipartisan, you know, the, the two, two out of the three bills were bipartisan. Um, they managed to get those over the legislative goal line. That strikes me as a really important accomplishment and one that's, um, I, I, I like to think is promising for our future. Jared Bernstein, member of the Council of Economic Advisors, thank you so much for coming and visiting the Peterson Institute this afternoon. I will have plenty of time this afternoon as I drive home through the Washington area commute to contemplate the importance of uh, your, your speech and the questions and answers. Well, that, thank you for the great questions in. and uh, for the invitation. Um, for those uh, in the audience, we invite you to join us again virtually next week on Thursday, October 6th at 1 p.m. Eastern time, when we'll have the honor of hosting Federal Reserve Governor Lisa Cook for her very first speech as a member of the Federal Reserve Board. Also on October 6th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, we will release the Peterson Institute's International Semi-Annual Outlook for the U.S. and Global Economies. Both of these events will be webcast live. And with that, I declare today's event to be adjourned.